Good, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm David Chalantano. If uh, I haven't met some of you, uh, I'm the honor of uh, being the chair of the Department of Epidemiology. And I think probably of all the people on the screen, other than perhaps if any of Terry's kids are on, uh, I probably have known Terry longer than any of you. Um, we, uh, we joined the faculty about the same time and uh, we both worked on a project with uh, Bernice Cohen in 1980, 81 on uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, I know nothing about COPD, but <laughs> I was the uh, person who was trained on a NIAAA alcohol abuse uh, training grant. And we were looking at alcohol consumption and that, its role in COPD. Uh, Terry and I have had a long history together. Uh, I guess it's 40 plus years. Um, and uh, we basically started out very young and we gracefully aged together. Uh, these, uh, these tributes to our, uh, our faculty who are planning to retire um, are really to celebrate uh, their, their legacy and uh, all that they have done in uh, the school and the university. And Terry inherited some pretty big shoes from Bernice Cohen. Uh, and the office is far less messy, trust me. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, I really want to uh, thank Terry for everything that she's done. She and I labored together as uh, John Samet's uh, deputy chairs. Uh, lots of responsibility and no authority. Uh, and that was really an, ex that was an experience. I think we both grade a bit from that. So without uh, further ado, I will turn it over to Priya. Hi, thank you, David. Um, let me take a moment just to introduce Terry and what she's done and how she's gotten here. So she got her BA in biology followed by her MA in zoology from the University of Texas, Austin. She then went on to get her PhD in human genetics at the University of Michigan, go blue. Um, and in 1980, um, she joined Johns Hopkins as a faculty member and was promoted to full professor in 1991. She was the director of the genetic epi program from 1989 to 2007, and she was deputy or vice chair of this department with David from 2006 to 2016. So I thought a little bit about how I could introduce Terry and think about what she's done and accomplished. And I thought since many of us here are academics and we're in an academic institution, we're very familiar with the idea of grants. And so when we think about grants, um, what is the most important thing we evaluate? And that's impact. So let's just take a look at Terry and think about where her impact has been. So we talk a lot and you're gonna hear some about research and scholarship. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about that except to tell you that she has more than 400 publications. Um, she has a textbook co-authored with another speaker here today and several um, dozen book chapters. Um, so moving beyond that, that huge impact that she has made in the fields of cleft lip and cleft palate and COPD and asthma and infectious diseases, um, we can think about teaching. So Terry has taught nearly consecutively for over 40 years. Um, for any of us that teach, I think that that is just an unbelievable statement um, to think that she has been a part of so many students' education and training. Um, and for any of you who have taken a class with her, you know that she takes every part of it exceptionally seriously. And for those of you who have taught with her as a co-instructor, and that includes most recently, um, Danny Fallon, Nalanjan Chatterjee, Allison Klein, you know that Terry starts planning for her course probably six months in advance. And as I just mentioned, she's been teaching for more than 40 years. That means she doesn't use the same slides every year. She is someone that will go through every single slide and make sure that she's updated it, that the latest information is included. And, and for anyone who teaches, you know that's exhausting, um, but that just shows you her dedication to the work that she does. She wants to make sure that students see that piece and are very current in what they have. 
And then the last piece is mentorship. Um, so Terry is actually trained per her CV more than 80 trainees here at Hopkins. And we have put together a really nice video that I hope that some of you may have a moment to review from her collaborators and from her trainees that speak to the testament of what Terry has offered them and what they have learned. Um, Terry's trainees have gone on to non-governmental organizations, to government organizations, organizations like NIH, to industry, and of course, into um, academia. And so many of them have actually reached their top leadership positions, and they themselves have had a tremendous impact in those areas. Terry's pointed out specifically in academia that she has two former students, both on today, um, at Peking University who are full professors, Hong Wong and Tao Wu, and three faculty members here at, this, and, at Johns Hopkins University, myself, Rasika Mathias, and Corinne Keat. Um, and that is only five of more than 80 trainees that have been unbelievably um, successful in their own rights and the works that they do. But something that's really unique about Terry is that she never claims any of those students. As being a trainee of hers myself, and I think I speak for the other trainees that are here today, um, she lets you fly in whatever area you need to fly in. And not once does she come back and say, that was my student, I did that. She is very quick to talk about your accomplishments and what you've brought to the table and what you've done. And that is exceptionally unusual in the field of academia. So I think without a doubt, her impact has been tremendous and she would definitely get funded um, if we were to look at her as, as a grant and not as an individual. But on behalf of your collaborators, your students and your trainees, Terry, I'm here to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us, the endless hours reading, editing, correcting so much of our work and the dedication to our learning and really just being you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. So we're going to move to um, Muin Khoury to um, say a few words about the early years with. I'm Muin Khoury. I uh, used to be at Hopkins a long time ago, and I want to tell you a little bit of my journey and how it intersected with with Terry. So do you see the uh, do you see the slides? I don't see them. I see your picture, uh, Laura. Uh, are the slides on? Oh, now they're on. Now they're coming. So here we are. So. Um, and David alluded to this earlier. Um, my story goes into, into four parts, what I call from Beirut to Baltimore, the early years. Uh, and then the second segment is 2539, exclamation mark, sick people die. This is my four years at Hopkins and how I intersected with Terry. And then the 10 years after that, where we worked together on the book, Fundamentals of Genetic Epi, and my, I moved to Atlanta. And then a little bit about the future and what's happening in <clears throat> beyond the human genome project. Next slide. So in the 70s, many years ago, I was a medical student at the American University of Beirut. And I was so much interested in epidemiology and genetics, uh, not because that Parut Armenian, who uh, everybody knows at Hopkins, uh, just came back from his training and taught me the first uh, course in epidemiology. But I was also reading Newton Morton, who in 1978 wrote, wrote the first book on genetic epidemiology. And after talking with uh, Harut and others, he said, you have to go to Hopkins. And so there is Bernice Cohen there, and uh, there is a program in genetic epidemiology. So I did. But before doing that, I had to go through Atlanta first, and th then the two years of the EIS program with my wife between 1980 and 82. Of course, you see uh, Abe Lelinfeld, uh, one of the giants at Hopkins and, and Bernice Cohen, who actually we owe a lot in the field of genetic epidemiology. Next slide. So upon arrival there, um, I was hit with the COPD study like everybody else. I was a student of Bernice and um, she had just published a paper in 1980 about COPD as a challenge in genetic epidemiology. And as a student, she got me working on it. So 2539 is the sample size of this cohort in which there were cases and controls and then follow up over time. There were lung cancer uh, 
cases, there were um, uh, COPD patients, et cetera, and then a, a follow-up um, component. This is where I met Terry for the first time. She just came, she was still fresh out of academia from Michigan. Uh, she taught me the, one of the first courses in EPI. We became colleagues and good friends. Uh, we, have, we share the same cohort. Uh, I have two girls, she has two boys about the same age. So we kind of uh, work together uh, with Bernice uh, sort of hovering over us. And I remember in, uh, in the early days when, uh, um, you know, meeting with uh, Terry and getting to know her, she just published a paper about uh, the impact of uh, uh, pulmonary function tests on mortality. And I said, congratulations, Terry. You did a great job with that paper. I said, oh, you know, in her own um, sort of unpretentious way, I said, what, what do you think? Sick people die. And I still remember that to the day where, uh, you know, Terry Beatty, you know, kind of just one of her own papers, like sick people die. If you have low FEV1 function on baseline, you have a higher chance of dying in the next five years. So that stuck with me. But we, we had fun working on, on the data sets together. We, we published a few papers, and then I, I learned a lot from Terry and Bernice, of course. Uh, next slide. So, and then I left. The appeal of uh, academia was, uh, was tremendous, but um, also the appeal of public health. I was offered the job at CDC with my wife, and, but uh, doing the work of Vertifex and epidemiology and genetics, we still kept in touch with Terry. We worked together on uh, uh, cleft uh, projects, uh, analyzing Atlanta data and others. And then we collaborated on the book. The book, actually, we started together just after I left. It took uh, almost seven years before it got published in 1993, uh, Bernice and I. And, and I took a look recently at the book and I said, did we write that? I mean, it, it's so outdated right now. If you think about genetic epidemiology today and how it was in 1993, you would think that we are in a different world. I mean, and certainly one of the things I failed to mention that that COPD study had a total of four genes that were measured. We had alpha-1 antitrypsin, we had the ABO blood groups, we have the secretor status, and then uh, the fourth gene that I'm forgetting right now, or oh, RH, uh, RH uh, uh, blood groups, and that was it. And 2539 seemed like a huge sample size at the time. So as the field progressed and the Human Genome Project started, you know, we started thinking about genetic epidemiology with, in, a, in a different context, not just as a gene hunting exercise, but what um, Duncan Thomas called genetic epidemiology with a capital E, having its foundation in epidemiology. Next slide. So what do we mean by capital E and capital G? You know, even today, people think about uh, genetic epidemiologists as finding genes. I, I tend to think about genetic epidemiology as more than that, trying to figure out the contributions of genes and environments and everything else on our health and health outcomes. And so when Duncan wrote this paper many years ago, he basically foresaw how the field is going to be moving from simple studies to large scale population studies like the UK Biobank, all of us, and multiple cohort studies where you measure everything that can be measured um, on the genetic and the environmental side. Of course, during those early days, um, after uh, Newton Morton published his uh, uh, first book, the journal was launched, the New Society was launched in 1992, and then the rest is history. Next slide. So what have I been doing in the last few years trying to figure out how a public health agency like CDC could apply human genomics. And I must say, it wasn't all easy. There are ups and downs. Uh, people in public health, even today, uh, do not have a very good appreciation of the role of genetics. Although, you know, Terry and I, you know, are old school. We think genetics has a lot to do with everything. But the world of public health is trying, still trying to figure out what the added value of genetics. Of course, being at CDC, the role of pathogen genomics and the rise of pathogen genomics has really um, uh, moved up a notch even before the human genome. I mean, if you think about COVID-19 and where we are now, I mean, seven genes and be, their sequence and the variants are attracting 
way more attention than the 20,000 genes that we have. And then the field evolved from genomic medicine to precision medicine and now precision public health. Next slide. So at the end of the day, it's all about epidemiology because we, in order to use anything, including our genes for interventions, for diagnosis, for treatment, for prediction, we need to calculate, communicate, and intervene. And I still remember this quote uh, from Spielberg uh, a few years ago about how uh, sequencing of the human genome offers the greatest opportunity for epi since John Snow discovered the Broad Street Pump. I, I truly believe so because there is so much that uh, the human genome can offer uh, both on the genetic side as well as trying to look at modified but risk factors through uh, tricks like Mendelian randomization and other things. Next slide. So at the end of the day, where we are now, and when Francis Collins wrote this paper back in 1999, making the prediction that in 2010, this is how medicine would look like. This is a hypothetical patient named John who goes to his healthcare provider and is offered his genome. And this is the printout of his data. And based on this printout, uh, he is prescribed a personalized uh, regimen for reducing his risk of these various diseases. Of course, what Francis failed to uh, uh, consider that epidemiological work to get lifetime and relative risks estimates and then merging that with environmental factors will take way more time than the 10 year horizon that he had in mind. Here we are in 2021 and we're nowhere close to that prediction. Next slide. So we have our work cut out for us. Those of us that uh, work in genetic epidemiology, the, the time has come because we uh, as genetic epidemiologists now have a, a true calling to work with every uh, part of medicine and public health, whether it's nutritional epidemiology, infectious disease epidemiology, environmental epidemiology. We have a set of tools that we can use to ask questions in all fields. At the end of the day, we do have to establish the utility of these findings, the they added value to improve population health. Next slide. So here we are in 2021, and genomics has really seeded way to omics at large and big data, and it's all about uh, big information coming down. And this reminded me of a <clears throat> paper I wrote a few years back in science. There's just too much data around, and you know, figuring out the noise from from the truth is becoming harder and harder. And we, we, we really need, I mean, if you think about it, epidemiologists will have a lot of work ahead and there is really no, uh, no stopping for epidemiology in the next 10 to 20 years. Next slide. So as I close out, looking back, looking ahead, it's been a fun journey, Harry. You and I have shared that last 40 years, perhaps in different locations, but we've shared our our passion for genetics, our passion for genetic epidemiology. You were in academia, I'm in government, but uh, we have a lot in common. And when people ask me, you know, what, what is the field looking like 40 years from now? I would say to them, look, I wish I started my career today, not 40 years ago, because I think the next 40 years are going to be so much more exciting in, in the field than the last 40 years. And with that, I'm going to see back and end my presentation. So thank you, Terry, for all your uh, contributions to Hopkins and the world of genetic epidemiology in general. Thank you, Maureen. So I'm going to take a moment and introduce our next speaker who is going to be joining us um, via video, not um, actually remotely because he's coming from Taiwan um, and he has recorded um, his presentation for us. And that's Kang Yi Liang. I think many of us here at Hopkins know him. He is a leading biostatistical scholar, um, has done incredible work in the field, um, specifically in the field of general estimating equations, um, is a good friend because he was here at Johns Hopkins um, and then left to return to Taiwan where he was president of Yangming University and president of the National Health Research Institute of Taiwan. Terry and um, Kang Yi are good friends and colleagues and collaborators and um, we look forward to hearing from him. 
Terry and I have known each other for almost uh, 40 years since I came to Hopkins in 1982, perhaps a couple years after Terry's arrival. But we really didn't know each other until 1984 when my colleague, uh, Steve Self, who has a, a master's degree in genetics and a PhD degree in biostatistics, decided to return to, to the West Coast. So uh, he introduced me to, to Terry, and that really uh, opens my eyes and the door to the genetic uh, research, which is very new to me. And I, I working together, I learned uh, jargons uh, such as uh, familial aggregation, path analysis, uh, uh, variance components, uh, language analysis, and so on and so forth. And uh, we work together by publishing uh, papers in uh, different uh, journals, such as uh, Genetic Epidemiology, American Journal of Human Genetics, uh, submitting grants to NIH, also for, uh, for me uh, to serve on uh, Terry's uh, student thesis committee, reading uh, their uh, proposal and the final work. And for me, that really uh, helped to expand my uh, research uh, spectrum uh, by expanding, for example, uh, the work with Scott Ziegler on longitudinal data analysis to uh, co correlate the data, including a uh, family study. Perhaps the thing I enjoyed most by working with uh, Terry was on teaching. Um, before, that was, must be uh, the beginning of the century, there was the so-called post-genomic uh, era. So genetic epidemiology has become one of the hardest, uh, hardest uh, fields. And as I recall, Terry and her uh, colleagues decided to reinvent the uh, core course of engineering epi from the epi department. And uh, they come up with a, a, a series of uh, uh, four, quarter, uh, four quarter courses. And I was asked by Terry to co-teach with her in the third quarter, focusing more on the design analysis uh, for segregation, uh, language analysis, and so on and so forth. And it was a very uh, challenging, looking back, and uh, also rewarding, as the, 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 the medians uh, was very mixed. Not only the students uh, from EPI, Biostat, and other departments in School of Public Health, but also fellows, uh, even faculty members from School of Medicine at Hopkins, and also some researchers from NIH who travel all the way from Bethesda to Baltimore. Of taking the courses. You hear uh, the questions uh, raised from the audience uh, looking at because different background, they're looking from a different angle. And Terry and I taking turn to answer this question. So there was a very, very uh, interesting rewarding, but also helpful for me as well. I hope the students uh, feel that way uh, as well. Now, in addition to uh, the, the four courses, Terry and I travel to a different part of the world, including Taiwan. I believe we gave a one week of course uh, in Taiwan in 1998, and um, also one in the Netherlands. And uh, also the, uh, in the beginning of the, the century, uh, uh, Terry Mimi Jabs, uh, who was a faculty at School of Medicine at that time, and I submitted a uh, grant proposal to uh, NIH uh, for the uh, Fogarty program. Uh, aims to um, train uh, genetic researchers from uh, China, Beijing, Beijing University in particular. Starting in 2004, we travel uh, usually in, in March to uh, Beijing for one, give a one week course. But during the, me the middle of the, uh, the week, we also interview some of the fellows therein, uh, by picking some of them to come to Hopkins, either doing postdoc or short term or PhD. Uh, uh, study of a long-term project. So now I have left uh, Hopkins for more for more than 11 years. Uh, really looking back, uh, working together with uh, Terry on um, both teaching and research and genetic research was really the highlight uh, of my uh, my career uh, at Hopkins. But I do have one complaint to Terry. Um, I hope she remembers that. that uh, for the back to the core courses, it, uh, it was arranged on Tuesday and Thursday morning from 8.30 to 10. 
My son is scheduled. I told Terry that I'm I'm really not an early bird. And 8:30 a little too early to, to me. And Terry's only uh, response was that you just need to learn how to get up early. And so that was the end of the conversation. And I mentioned that uh, we know each other for many many years. Sure, there are many things we can say about Terry, but uh, two words that come to my mind uh, first and most. Uh, one is the um, persistence. The other one is, is the uh, perseverance. Uh, like many of you, that uh, we always uh, ups and down when you submit the grants, uh, submit the manuscript of journals. But uh, for Terry, uh, she always stay calm, keep her composure, and working hard together, responding to the comments. And usually we get what we uh, wishes. So that's really a, a joy uh, working at Terry for I just counted for about 26 years together. I understand that Terry will be uh, uh, retiring next year. Uh, I hope that uh, you will find more time to do the things like you do uh, traveling to different country, uh, including Taiwan. I um, will we'll be more than delighted to, to serve as your, your host. So I wish you nothing but all the best. Um, so I definitely see a theme coming here um, overall, but definitely persistence and perseverance. Um, our last um, speaker before Terry is um, Kathleen Barnes, another friend. Um, so Mwin, Akangi, and Kathleen, all three of whom have left us, but Kathleen was a faculty member here at Hopkins um, for so many years as well, a full professor before she left us for the University of Colorado to um, initiate the personalized medicine program there. Um, and she has done phenomenal work um, in the field of genetics, specifically in asthma and um, allergy, and most importantly, with individuals of non-European ancestry, which has been really fundamental um, to our understanding of disease process. So um, I will turn this over to Kathleen. Thank you, Priya. Uh, okay. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Seeing the presenter yes. mode, Kathleen. Uh -oh. Shit. Sorry. There we go. Uh, I don't Sorry. think it's I don't think it's in presenter mode yet, is it? No, slide, play from start. Yep. Yep. There we go. Got it. Yep. Looks okay. Good. Great. Um, wow, it's it's such an honor to be here, Terry, and. Um, and, and particularly with um, such incredible colleagues of yours, Kung Yi, Muin, um, I, I, I feel really privileged. Um, I'm, I think Priya just hit it on the head. There's some common themes here and I'm probably gonna underscore a lot of what's been said already. Um, I'll start with um, you know, how I met Terry. So I was asked to speak about the later years, but Terry, in reflecting on our partnership and friendship for now 28 years and counting, um, it doesn't feel like the later years to me. Uh, it feels my, my entire career. Um, <clears throat> and so for, for those of you who don't know how I met Terry, I came to Hopkins as a postdoc fellow in 1993. Uh, to work with David Marsh in the Division of Clinical Immunology in the Department of Medicine. Um, I was very, very grateful to uh, very early on uh, also join the Department of Epidemiology. And for those of you who didn't know David Marsh, um, he was a tough character. Um, many on this call do remember David. And to that end, my early relationship with Terry was really critical for my sanity. Um, I had just uh, finished my field work as a doctoral student in um, biomedical anthropology at the University of Florida. Um, and I had focused on a study um, in Barbados on asthma epidemiology. And uh, David took a big gamble on me. I was, you know, as one of the only social scientists in a very um, MD centric and very male dominated um, department. Um, I, I felt like he really gambled on me. He brought me on board to expand the Barbados study, um, as well as other uh, population studies. And, um, and I did my immunogenetics, a postdoctoral fellowship under him. 
Um, and he also brought me on board, and you'll hear a little more about this in a minute, to take on a coordinating role of a, a brand new uh, national study called the La uh, Collaborative Study on the Genetics of Asthma. Um, and it was the first of its kind as a multi-center study. Um, so I met Terry very quickly because, in fact, she and David had already been collaborating quite extensively on the genetics of total IgE and allergic disease for some time. Um, and Terry was, of course, the lead genetic epidemiologist, statistical geneticist in David's projects. Um, so with that, I, I, as soon as I arrived, I jumped into revamping this, this project in Barbados, um, adding a genetics component, going back and re-recruiting families and expanding that population initially as a family-based and then as a case control study. It, it didn't take a lot of arm twisting to get Terry to come with me on those field trips. Um, it turns out she had a long-standing craving to become a scuba diver, and she knew that I liked to scuba dive when I went to Barbados. That's where I did all of mine. And uh, she was looking for nice places to try out her new certification. Um, but b before we, we go there, I need to share a really poignant story about Terry. So, and this has probably happened to a lot of um, of folks along their training. So as I said, David was a difficult personality and his expe expectations were really high. Um, I came along just around the time he published um, his most successful paper in science, which was a summary of um, a genetic study of allergic disease among the Amish. Terry was very much a part of that study. Um, unfortunately for me and everyone after me, David expected every paper to be eligible for science or nature. And um, I just wanted to get my first paper out. So, you know, I'd done all this work and I was year three into, um, I moved on from a postdoc into junior faculty. I was working on this manuscript and, and I felt like I had nothing to show for the time that I had been there. And, um, and, and could, because David wanted to revise the paper, add more and more. And so I went to Terry's office and I'm pretty sure I had a, a major breakdown. And, um, and she just looked at me as I told my story and kind of shook her head and she mumbled, sometimes you just got to hit David over the head with a two by four. And um, she just said to me very quietly, I'll take care of it. Um, and in fact, shortly thereafter, I don't know what she said to David uh, to bring him to reason, but in a matter of days, uh, he let me submit that manuscript. Um, it, was, it was very quickly um, accepted and published and um, and that was really an important lesson for me from Terry. Um, you know, frank and candid conversations, rational negotiation, um, and most important, advocating for junior junior faculty. And we we keep hearing more and more about that. We all know that about Terry. Um, I'm forever grateful for that that single act, Terry, because that paper really launched my career. It allowed me to create a niche um, that would lead to countless manuscripts and continuous NIH funding for over 20 years. So I'm particularly grateful. And someone mentioned your remarkable, Priya, your remarkable publication record. I'm very proud to say that Terry, I counted them yesterday. We've published 115 manuscripts together since that first paper of 1996. Um, so thank you. Um, so Terry, myself, and a number of other folks here also, I mentioned the Collaborative Study on Genetics of Asthma, or CSGA. This was a multi-center study. David was one of four sites. Um, this was a huge NHLBI initiative. It was the first genome-wide candidate gene linkage study on asthma. But oh my god, what a dysfunctional group of scientists. And um, the and, and I the slides are swapped out, but you know I would attend these meetings as a very young scientist, and there was yelling and screaming, and David was at the top of it, and Terry was always the voice of calm. Um, it, it's very unfortunate that um, that David um, and and this was a significant loss for many of us in the field. Um, that uh, he succumbed. He was a dear friend to all of us and was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. Um, and passed away on his 58th birthday in um, 1998 or 1999. And, um, and Terry immediately jumped in and took the reins of working with this very dysfunctional group. We call it the uncollaborative study on the genetics of asthma. And, um, and she did so quietly, but she really used it as an opportunity to allow others of us to to really get more engaged in that project, probably in ways that David would would never have um, would never have agreed to. 
Um, so in, in sharing this door, she opened, uh, she, in sharing the road, she really opened the door for, for many of us to do something bigger. Um, and her advice and, and always being at my side and encouraging me was truly instrumental in taking the next steps and building what would ultimately lead in consortia focused, as Priya mentioned, on populations of underrepresented minorities. Um, and, and I'll talk about a couple of those. Grad was the first consortium. Kappa came next. This particular photo, which I love, um, you know, and again, thanks to Terry and her support, we were able to get NHLBI to come to Annapolis and have a two day conference in bringing together the US based asthma genetics community as well as the European asthma genetics community. Um, and that, again, opened the door to do something much bigger. I mentioned um, Grad being our first consortia, and she was, um, and that was actually the first NIH-funded study for a GWAS on asthma explicit, uh, exclusively for populations of African ancestry. Um, and really what's been the pinnacle of my career, and I couldn't have done it without Terry, who's been very much a part of that, Rasika, others, was our ability to put together the Consortium on Asthma Among Af African Ancestry Populations in the Americas, or CAPA. Um, and, and this project, in, in my opinion, and this is a team effort, so it's not about my success, but it, it really has changed the way we think about the human genome in populations of African ancestry, not just for asthma, but for multiple diseases. So I've left out all the fun stuff, and I'll conclude with that. Um, like I said, Terry never missed an opportunity to take a field trip to Barbados with us, and we did a lot. Um, she really couldn't draw blood. She could consent or administer a questionnaire. I don't think she particularly enjoyed doing that, but she, she'd roll up her sleeves and do whatever we asked her to do. Um, but she could definitely hold her own on a challenging scuba outing, uh, deep wrecks, et cetera. Um, and we really became close scuba partners. Um, and on all that said, she made a contribution um, beyond sort of the academic tasks and, um, and, and the good times that we had, but her, her re international reputation brought such a level of credibility to the projects that I was standing up. Um, and I really think that contributed to their success. I've never underestimated the importance of being affiliated with Terry Beatty on my studies. Um, we played hard when we were on these trips together. Um, but at the end of the day, seeing all this coming together of experts in so many different corners of medicine and epidemiology, Terry always being right there, um, it gave me a level of confidence, Terry, that I, I truly couldn't have done by myself. Um, you've been a constant in my life and in every corner of work, community, self, and uh, family. So um, I'll conclude with there's lots of lessons from Terry. Um, after nearly 30 years in this profession for myself, she's probably the only female mentor that um, I've ever had. Uh, she swooped in with the untimely death of my um, primary mentor at the most uh, critical point of my career, really proving my independence. Um, Terry, you've, and we've heard this from the others, you've never hesitated to tell me what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. Um, I'll never remember, I'll never forget, um, I shared with her that I was going to have my third child, and she looked at me and shook my head and asked why I was doing that. Two was enough. Um, and never, never failed to, to share her opinions, but was always there to share in the joy of each one of my children um, at the time of their birth. So I'll summarize Terry by a couple, a couple bullets here. Integrity. I think what Terry taught me over the years is to be honest with yourself and be honest with others. Um, and, and that is certainly her characteristic. Always do what you believe is right, even if others don't agree, and that can be hard to do. Um, stay the course, even under adverse, adversity. Terry, I think of those CSGA days, and you just you never missed a beat, um, despite a really tough crowd. Um, just get it out there. I've heard that many, many times in my career, and um, and thanks for saying that to David, Terry. Um, don't mince words. Say it like it is. We've heard a lot of that. Um, and let those who come after you shine, give others the opportunity. Um, and I think most important what I've learned from Terry is, is to take time for family, friends, and self, because this is what really defines us. So um, with that, Terry, thank you for everything that you've given me over the last near 30 years, um, and to all of us, truly. Thank you, Kathleen.
And so Terry, it's now you. We would love to hear from you. And I will turn this over. Oh, Laura has my slides. I hope. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit of mix, a little bit of personal stuff, a little bit of genetic epidemiology stuff. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Okay, uh, I just wanted to let you know, I do have a life outside of Providence, just in case you were wondering. Um, and um, the picture on, on the left, the blue star, that's me. And that is my, all my siblings. So if you're gonna do a sibship study, be prepared to deal with differences in ages and human development. And on the right is a cousinship. The two with the yellow stars are my two sons, Matt and Ben, with their maternal grandmother, the last one, last living grandparent, and their two first cousins, Cody and Taylor. And so if you're gonna do a cousinship study, be prepared to travel to multiple states and deal with differences in age. Because now that would be for those cousins, that's three states and one other country because Matt is working in England today, uh, but he's joined us by Zoom and Ben is here in Baltimore. Uh, next slide, please. And yes, families expand and they continue. On the left is Ben and his family with three children, William, Henry and Charlotte and his wife, Eva, uh, his maternal grandmother, as I said, and me. And on the right is Matt and his two boys, Nicholas and Owen and his wife, Lee, who's also on Zoom, I, thought, I saw, with his grandmother and me. So families just get bigger, more complicated, more scattered. If you're going to track them down, be prepared to travel. Um, okay, next slide. So there's a lot of people to thank. I've worked with a lot of people uh, over the years. And I just wanted to list, list some of the key ones, obviously Bernice Cohen that uh, David uh, and Wayne both mentioned. She was the one that started the genetic epi program here at Hopkins. And um, in 1979, it was the first one devoted to genetic epidemiology. Harold Minkes was a pulmonologist that worked with her on the big COPD study. Well, okay, we thought it was big. Pete Quitterbitch was the uh, lipid guy from the School of Medicine. And I remember when Joe Korish and Valerie uh, Pringer were doing their respective dissertations, Joe picked APOB and used Peter's data and Valerie picked APOA1 and used Peter, uh, Peter's data. And of course, Linda Cow, who was a key member of our program for a long time, Steve Levin, in medicine who helped me get into the world of dental research. Of course, David Marsh. I don't know how many of you remember Tony Murphy, but he was a character in medicine and he was more prolific. He was one of the best writers. Okay, I didn't always understand his papers, but they were very well written. And then Victor McCusick, who worked so hard to get the uh, Mendelian inheritance uh, in man online um, and found the whole genetics program in medicine. I also want to mention the JHU people who have moved on. Uh, Kangi mentioned Steve Self, who's now in Seattle. Uh, Debbie Myers, who's uh, Arizona, I think. Uh, Jean Peng Zhu uh, uh, did a postdoc with Debbie and worked with me on several projects. And he's been at two or three different universities. Emily Harris, who went to NIDCR. Gloria Peterson, who's at Mayo Clinic. Uh, Ingyao Shugart, who's now at Kudan University, Steve Brandt, who's at Rutgers. I uh, kind of lost track of Gloria. I, I'm not sure where she is. Simeon Boyd, who's in California. Mimi Jabs, who's in New York. Craig Vanderkolk, um, mostly clinical practice now. And then, of course, Kathleen and Kungi have told you their stories. Uh, I also want to uh, extend thanks to some key JHU current collaborators. In particular, you saw Ingo in one of those pictures from Barbados uh, and Margaret Taub and the Langen Chatterjee uh, co-instructors. Um, 
Alison Klein, Rossica, Rob Scharf in medicine. So there's many, many more, but those names came to mind. And I'd also like to thank and recognize uh, outside collaborators, Mary Marizita from University of Pittsburgh, uh, Ron Munger from Utah State, Jeff Murray from Iowa, Elizabeth Leslie from Emory, Joan Bailey Wilson from National Human Genome Research Institute, Selma Geronimo from Brazil, Holger Schwinder now back in Germany, Alexander Barreau in Canada, Ed Silverman, John O'Kanson, James Crapo and Elizabeth Reagan, and Michael Chow all involved in COPD genes. So I didn't, I never particularly understood all of COPD, um, but it turns out that I started working on it when I was first hired and here I am still working on it and I haven't solved the damn thing, but I'm working on it. And then of course, former students and postdocs, uh, each of whom are special in their own way. Uh, and I must say, I'm very grateful to uh, Priya and Rasa who came up with the next slide. Um, yeah, so this picture in the middle that has the little double helix for the DNA stuff, and it's too small to see, but there are names of individuals uh, scattered up and down the tree and some on the birds. Uh, as uh, Priya mentioned, there are uh, faculty in the School of Medicine uh, Rasika, Priya, Corin Keat, um, and then uh, Hank Joe was uh, the first doctoral student I had who finished in under four years. He was he moved quickly, and I believe he's now chair of a university a department in the university in Taiwan, southern Taiwan, maybe Kaohsiung. I'm not sure the name. Um, the two on the left, upper left, uh, those are a postdoc and a doctoral student, uh, Hong Wong, Peking University, Department of Biostat, and then Tao is at the School of Public Health where Biostat is merged with epidemiology. And both full professors at Peking University. Bart Kameni, a postdoc here, is now uh, in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, um, Radboud Medical Center, and he's a member of the European Academy of Science. And then Ping Yang is, uh, I believe I saw her name on the call, a full member uh, at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Arizona. So uh, people have gone on to do good work. Of course, I can't fit in all the pictures, but uh, some people have gone to NIH, some people have gone to academia, uh, some people have gone into industry. So they've all been uh, I'm very proud of all of them, I, uh, and I wish them well, and I hope they keep doing great and interesting stuff. Next slide, please. So I just want to briefly review some of the history of genetic epidemiology. I mean, if you go back to the 50s and the 60s, you'll see an occasional mention of those two words put together. But as Moyne said, Morton at the University of Hawaii did a lot to pull it together into a field. And um, it started out being very descriptive, just, you know, sometimes you can document that a positive family history in itself is a, is a major risk factor for diseases like prostate cancer and breast cancer. So then we need consistent and reliable measures of family history because families are complicated. They're big, they're scattered. They can include all people, people of all ages. So the risk factor means something and it can lead to further family studies. And then uh, we can go on and do more genetic oriented studies such as linkage studies that Kathleen talked about with asthma in multiplex families, if you can find the multiplex families. And they always work for Mendelian diseases and many common chronic diseases have a certain unknown percentage that are basically Mendelian. And it may be that there's one mutation in a single gene, or it may be that there's a thousand mutations in a single gene, each one very rare, but collectively you can still identify the gene. And that may or may not explain all the biology, but at the very least, like with the BRCA1 and 2, it can explain risk in a small fraction of individuals and that can be acted upon. So there's a preventive step involved. Uh, more classically in epidemiology, they do association studies 
large and small, and they keep getting larger and larger and larger to compare groups, cases versus controls, uh, a quantitative trade across a large cohort. But all of these are, is a large samples of unrelated people can lead to confounding, uh, which produces bias in your test statistic, bias in your estimators, and how do you correct for that when you've got thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of unrelated individuals? And these days, as Maureen mentioned, we have to deal with sequencing data, either whole exome or whole genome, and oh my gosh, it is so messy. And then the problem is we don't understand the impact of all nucleotides, so we're not really sure uh, what it means. We think we can identify a functional gene most of the time. Next slide, please. And then when we look to the future, it gets more challenging, but a little scary. I'm not sure I want to stay another 40 years because we're going to have to learn to do genome-wide data on quantitative measures of things like DNA methylation, the epigenetic modification, which can identify inactivated genes, or RNA expression, which reflects the activity of genes in transcription into RNA, or just measure the protein that is the functional gene product. Or maybe you're interested in the metabolomic measures that measure what these gene products do do they produce a lot of insulin, a little insulin, not so much insulin? And each one of these omics measures can be used to identify quantitative trait loci, places in the genome that control how much are methylated, expressed, function as proteins. So you get this MQTL, EQTL, PQTL, et cetera. But when you switch to omics, you have to address that tissue issue very carefully. The time and place are very important in biology. And if you want to understand disease, especially if you want to understand liver disease, does it really help to have RNA expression in whole, white blood cells? Maybe, maybe not. Are you talking about a whole tissue or a single cell? And what does all of this mean? Next slide. So, this is just some of the advantages of, of going to faraway places. So, you know, if you go to Barbados, you can go scuba diving. If you go to Taiwan and know for a one week course like Kung Yi and I did, you can take a trip to uh, national parks. Uh, and the, the man on the left uh, of the picture with the bridge fan is Sal Hong. Uh, can you go back a little? Sorry, Terry, I skipped a slide. Do you want to be on the Taiwan slide? My apologies. Yes, please. Yes, so uh, the man on the leftmost uh, is Sao Hung Lan, a former doctoral student who's now uh, in Taiwan. And then there's Kangi and I before either one of us had gray hair. So next slide. And here's a picture of Priya and I and Selma Geronimo at a tropical medicine meeting in Brazil. Also a beautiful place to visit. Uh, next slide. And you can do interesting work through international collaborations. I frankly think Kathleen Barnes is one of the best at keeping her cool uh, in dealing with these large numbers of sometimes difficult people uh, who work in all together and they say they really want to collaborate, but they've got big egos and uh, peculiarities. But uh, here's a picture of a group that we had. Uh, we had a study that ran for some time uh, the International Genetic Epidemiology of Oral Clefts. This was an early meeting in Singapore at KK Women and Children's Hospital. Obviously, the man in scrubs, Vincent Yao, is the surgeon. And uh, next to him is me and then Ron Munger from Utah State, who also did a study in Utah of uh, clefts. We pulled together a mix of babies and their parents ascertained through a cleft baby from the U.S., including Hopkins, Pittsburgh, University of Maryland, University of Iowa, Utah State, Europe. We had samples from Norway, Denmark. We had Asian sites, uh, Taiwan. Um, the second from the right is Dr. Wu Chow, Dr. Yahweh Wu Chow of uh, uh, 
Chungkang Memorial Hospital, where they started cleft surgery in Taiwan. This was supported by a mix of NIH grants. First, we got a planning grant, an R21. Then we had an R01 that went a couple of cycles. Then we got a U01 for a collaboration through the Geneva Consortium. Geneva is for genes and environmental uh, interaction. And then we were part of the first round of the face space Consortium. And that supported uh, further analysis, further genotyping. We did the first um, case parent trio design study of oral clefts using money from Geneva. And now we have moved on with uh, especially collaborators uh, from Pittsburgh and Emory uh, with whole genome sequencing of Hopkins and Taiwanese trios through the Kids First Consortium. It's an EXO one, they just pay for it. And then we get the data and we have to figure out what it means. And now the last batch of cleft palate trios is finished at the Center for Inherited Disease Research. Again, whole genome sequencing. So we have tons of data and we have good people to work on them, uh, but those good people need help. Uh, in particular, Ingo Rosensky and Debashri Ray are working from a statistical approach. And so if any of the students uh, are interested in especially statistical aspects of analyzing whole genome sequencing data, well, reach out, talk to me, talk to Ingo, talk to Debashri. We have data. Um, and um, so it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, and if anybody's really interested in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I'm still part of the COPD gene consortium and they have data uh, on a very large cohort of heavy smokers with whole genome sequencing and a lot of the omics stuff to RNA and protein data. Uh, and uh, so we're open to people who want to get uh, projects to work on. Next slide. Okay, I think it just, it was short. It just said, it's been fun. There you go. Uh, so that's pretty much it. And we're right at the time limit, Laura. So um, take it over. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, so uh, we have till uh, 120, so we have about five minutes. Um, uh, so I know this isn't a traditional sort of Q&A. Um, yes, wonderful, wonderful job, Terry. You're getting, I'm gonna save the chat for you. You've really gotten some oh, wonderful great. comments there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but does anyone want to um, say a, a quick few words? I can uh, turn on allowing people to unmute themselves or if there's any Brief questions for Carrie, Terry, I'm happy to monitor. You can either raise hand or just, just speak into the chat. Hey, mom, I'm proud of you. Uh, this is beautiful. Thank you, Ben. Thank nice you work. <laughs> so I you can't can have a picture of Ben and Eric there with a the little yellow star over his head, but he came, <laughs> came to town. Yeah, and I see Gloria Peterson reminded me, I forgot to mention Gary Chase. He was a great statistician here at Hopkins. Um, anyone else? All right, so um, then with that, I'm gonna thank, thank everyone for coming.